All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started in our uh, fourth session on with the Master in Fullness of Joy and looking at the need to not get caught in our past or even our present, but to move on. And so uh, the importance of pressing on or going on. <clears throat> so turn with me to Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. I had the wonderful privilege when my husband was at the Master Seminary. He was in the first graduating class in the 80s. But I had a wonderful privilege of being discipled by Elizabeth George. Many of you know her. And um, for a couple of years while I was out there. And she's written several books. But one that I think specifically is very good in helping women um, with their thought life is Loving God with All Your Mind. And in that book, she tells a story about a missionary who was trying to teach his people the verses that we're going to cover in this lesson. And uh, several days after the lesson, one of his students approached the missionary with the following poem that he wrote that he felt would explain the verses that we're getting ready to cover. And the poem went like this. Go on, 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 go on. Now, there are seven more identical stanzas to this poem. <laughs> and don't worry, I am not going to bore you with them. But I'm sure you get the message this student was trying to convey, right? Go on. <laughs> but Paul says it a little more differently and in a little more detail, and I'm glad because I'm not sure I could exposit very much on two words, go on, go on, go on, go on. So uh, let's see how Paul puts it, Philippians 3, 12 to 14. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on for, so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forget those things which are behind and reach forth to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the outline for this lesson, you have it there before you, Lord willing. The, we're going to look, first of all, the reason that Paul goes on, verse 12. Secondly, the right means that Paul takes to go on in verse 13. And then the reward that Paul is going to receive for going on in verse 14. Now, let's first of all look at the reason that Paul goes on. He says, not that I've already attained. Paul says, you know what? I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I haven't attained. I have not laid hold of perfection yet. Ladies, contrary to what many people teach today in churches, you are not going to attain to perfection in this life. And, uh, you know, Paul even realized that. I haven't attained. I'm not perfect. I'm not there yet. And uh, I've often told people, you know, if you ever meet someone that says they don't sin, I would say, I'd like to meet their spouse and ask them <laughs> because I bet they would tell me a little bit different story. The only time we are going to attain or get that perfection is in glory. I have never met a perfect person. And if you have, I want to talk to you afterwards, if you can catch me before I leave. And so Paul's saying, I want you guys to know I haven't attained. I am not perfect. And you know, that would be an amazing statement because to the church at Philippi, Paul was a spiritual giant. I mean, we'd say, wow, you're kidding me. He hasn't attained? In fact, you might be, Paul might be tempted to think, you know, hey, maybe I have, because in Philippians chapter 3, he starts talking about, you know, I'm circumcised the eighth day, I'm the stock of Israel, the tribe of the, of the Hebrews, uh, I'm all these things concerning zeal, I persecuted the church, touching the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. But Paul said, even though I have all those qualities, I am not perfect. Lady, no one's attained, no one is perfect. I don't know who your spiritual guru is, your idol, but he or she has, hopefully it's not Joel Osteen or Joel, Joyce Myers, but I don't know who it is. You know, there's so many out there today, John MacArthur, John Piper, you know, hopefully not Rick Warren, but uh, <clears throat> Martha Peace, Elizabeth, you know, whoever they are, no one has attained. Now, if someone in this life tries to tell you they have, you better beware and get away from them. <laughs> because Paul says, therefore, let him who thinks he has thinks he stands, take heed, least you what? Fall. Better be careful. Lazy is the closer that you and I get to Jesus Christ, the more we should see our sinfulness and the more we realize that we haven't attained. In fact, the closer we get to God, the more we see our wretchedness and our wickedness. In fact, one writer says the way up is the way down, right? <laughs> 
And Paul goes on to say, he goes, not, all, 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 not only have I not attained, I'm not already perfected. This means to be made perfect or complete in the sense of reaching one's prescribed goal. It pertains to sinless affection. I haven't attained, I'm not perfect. So what should we do, Paul? I mean, if I can't reach perfection in this life, why should I try? I mean, why don't I just give up? I'm tired of fighting against sin. I'm tired of it. Well, Paul gives the reason for why he goes on. Notice what he says. So that I, I press on so that I can lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. The words press on here mean to follow after or pursue an object, striving to obtain it. Paul says, I steadily pursue my course. I don't give up. I go on and on and on and on. I persevere. And do you know a genuine Christian perseveres? Paul talks a lot about that in Hebrews. You are Christ's son, or we might say Christ's daughters, if you hold fast to the end. If you hold fast to the end. Ladies, if you don't hold fast to the end, it proves you are never of them because John says they went out from us for they were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. They went out. It might be made manifest. They were never of us. They apostatized because they were never of us. But so Paul says, I press on. I keep persevering. Why? Why do you persevere, Paul? Notice what he says. So that I can lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. What does that mean? Well, the lay hold of means to see suddenly and with eagerness, to reach for something. What is Paul reaching for? Notice what he says. For that thing which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What's Paul saying here? Listen very carefully. Paul wants to reach and to lay hold on the purpose for which Jesus Christ took hold of him on the Damascus road when he saved him. I'm grasping for that which also I was grasped. We could put it that way. In fact, the idea that Paul is Paul is saying I've been, when he was called on the Damascus road by the Lord for a purpose, and that purpose was to serve. In fact, the Lord laid hold of Paul for a definite purpose, so Paul would lay hold of that for which now Christ had laid hold of him. In fact, let's go back to the time that he's talking about. Look back at Acts chapter 9. Amazing story here when Christ laid hold of Paul. When did he, you know, and he's, if you are born again, you know there was a time when Christ Jesus laid hold of you too? And I'm thankful he did. I'm thankful he laid hold of me especially in my hypocrisy. But here's Paul's story. We all have a story. Here's Paul. Look at Acts 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise, and you will go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was there three days without sight, neither ate, eat, ate or drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he's praying. And in a vision he's seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he will suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, entered his house, laid his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, <laughs> the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he was, had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent many days with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. 
Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is not this he who destroyed those who were called on this name in Jerusalem? And he's come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And after many days, the Jews plotted to kill him. What was the purpose for which Jesus Christ laid hold of Paul or seized Paul? The answer is found in our Lord's verses in verse 15. Here's the purpose. To bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. My sister, do you realize God seized you? He grasped you with an eagerness for a purpose, and that purpose is to serve him? Did you know that? He didn't save you so you could sit around and eat chocolate bonbons and watch soap operas. Do you know what your purpose is? Do you know what your purpose in life is? I think it's very important that we know what God has called us to be and to do and then that we do it. And Paul says, I want to lay hold of that thing for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. That's why I keep moving. That's why I go on, go on, go on, go on. Well, after Paul gives the reason for why he goes on, he, give, he then gives two right reasons or means for which to go on. I know some people in this life want to go on, but the means they use are worldly, and they result in unrighteousness, but not Paul. He wants to go on in the right way. Notice what he says in verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forward to that which is ahead. Now, Paul uses the term brethren to show him he loves them. It's a term of endearment, but he's very concerned. He's very moved about this matter because you know what? Nothing new under the sun, and I imagine that like there's many of you here today that are having, struggling, moving on. You're kind of becoming apathetic. You're kind of tired of the Christian walk and the struggles and the burdens and the fight against sin. There's nothing new under the sun. There were those in Paul's day too. I mean, we have that Yodian syndicate, soon touchy in Philippians chapter 4 that were fighting. I don't know what their problem was. Probably had something to do over whether you homeschool or not or the color of the carpet or something. I don't know. But nothing new under the sun. We've always got issues. And Paul's very concerned about them. He's very moved about this matter. Brethren, sistren, <laughs> I do not count myself to have apprehended. Remember, I'm not perfect. I haven't attained. But then he goes on to say, but this one thing I do. Notice, Paul does not say, as some of us would say, I have a million things to do. That's what I keep telling myself. I have a million things to do. Paul has one thing to do. One thing alone. In fact, the one thing Paul has to do is found in verse 14, which is to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And by the way, my friend, no matter if you think you have a lot of things to do today or tomorrow or the next day, you know you have one thing to do. You have one thing you need to be doing. Press toward the goal for the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. In fact, Warren Wiersbe says this, one thing is a phrase that is important to the Christian life. One thing you lack, said Jesus to the self-righteous rich young ruler. One thing is needful, he said to busy Martha when she criticized her sister. One thing I know, said the man who had received his sight by the power of Christ. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, said the psalmist. And then he goes on to say, too many Christians are too involved in many things when the secret of progress is to concentrate on one thing. Ladies, do you know that was the turning point in D.L. Moody's life? And too bad the school he founded has now gone botched. But when, back when I went to Moody Bible Institute, it was a Bible school where I actually taught you how to study the Bible. Now it's become, like many good institutions, it's become very integrational and not a school that I would recommend. But do you know when D.L. Moody founded, before he founded <clears throat> Moody Bible Institute, remember the great Chicago fire? You young girls probably don't know. The cow that kicked over the lantern. Not the cow that kicked over the moon, but the lantern. And uh, there was that great Chicago fire in 1871. And before that happened, D.L. Moody was involved in Sunday school promotions, YMCA, evangelistic meetings, and all these things, he was doing all this stuff. And after the Chicago fire, the great Chicago fire, which is where he lived, that's where Moody Bible Institute is. After that great Chicago fire, 
You know, he reevaluated his life. Because, you know, tragedy has a way of causing us to reevaluate our lives, doesn't it? And I know that those of you that co go to Cornerstone, you've just had a serious tragedy with the death of a dear brother. But that often causes us to stop and think, right? What am I doing with my life? And he decided after the great Chicago fire that he would devote himself to one thing, and that was evangelism. He felt like that was the reason that Christ had laid hold of him, was to be an evangelist. In fact, this one thing I do became a reality to him, and as a result, millions of people heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because D.L. Moody finally became focused on one thing. Ladies, that's why I think it's imperative to know what God has called you to be and to do. And I'm so thankful many years ago, a long time ago, my husband said, Susan, you need to write out a purpose statement. And I'm like, what do you mean a purpose statement? He said, why did God save you? What is the one thing that he wants you to be doing with your life? Besides what is obvious, a mother, a wife, and a grandma. And you know what? I'm really glad that my husband had me do that because I wrote out a purpose statement, what I really felt God wanted me to do with my life. And you know what? It's really made me more focused and more productive for the Lord's work and to be able to press on. And it helps me weed out things that are peripheral and uh, concentrate on the one thing that is needful, when the thing that I should be doing, and to do it with excellence. Ladies, in order for you and I and Paul to strive for that one thing, we must forget some things and we, and we must reach for some things. In fact, Paul puts it like this. I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. Now, the word forget here is very interesting. It means to lose it out of your mind. <laughs> to completely forget it. To no longer be influenced or affected by it. Now, what is Paul choosing to forget? Those things which are behind. This means all of his gross failures, the fact that he killed Christians even, all the bad things, you know, the, the sexual abuse, not Paul, but those, those that have been abused, it means you forget those things, you lose it out of your mind, you choose not to dwell on it. But it would mean also his great advantages. I mean, he was, a, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was of the stock of Israel. He was the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, hey, I've arrived. No, I haven't. I've got to forget that too. I've got to forget my great advantages and my gross failures. I've got to forget it all. In fact, the word behind here comes from the same Greek word in Luke 9, 61 and 62 when one came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I want to follow you, but first let me go and bury, you know, my brother or bid farewell to those in the house. And Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back behind is fit for the kingdom of God. In fact, the word back is the same word for behind. And the Philippians would understand what Paul is referring to here because at this time... In the biblical world, they were involved in Olympic races, so they would understand what he's talking about, pressing forward, forgetting what is behind and pressing forward. Because if you're running in an Olympic race and you're trying to reach the goal, you'd be a fool to turn and look back, right? Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to lose the race if you turn around and look back. It's going to slow you down, and you're going to start watching others and see how they're running the race. Now, Paul is saying he, don't, he did not run the race by stopping to look at his past or to stop and think of the obstacles that were in his way, but he ran with a single eye, a single object in view, which was what? The prize. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Ladies, you and I must, we must do the same. Do not look back and allow your past to affect the race you are in right now. And I want to speak very candidly to you about your past or becoming a victim of your past. I know many women that I counsel, they say, well, I'm, you know, it's just, I'm, it's, I'm just, it's because of how I was brought up or it's because of my past. This is the way I am because this is how I was brought up and I'll never change. You know, I came from a dysfunctional family, so I'm dysfunctional. I want to know who in here didn't come from a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Do you know what dysfunctional means? I looked it up in the dictionary. It means to perform badly or improperly. So you know what? We're all dysfunctional. How many of you have performed badly or improperly at one time or another? The rest of you are liars, and the Bible says no liar will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So those of you that won't admit it, you're lost. I'm sorry, according to what John says in Revelation. 
But you know, when I looked up that in the dictionary, I almost laughed out loud because we're all sinners. We all perform badly. The point is we should not allow those things to hinder us from pressing on, no matter what's happened to us in the past or what we've done in the past. You know, sometimes I can start thinking about my life before Christ, and I can literally get sick to my stomach thinking about my sin before Christ. But you know what? I can't, I can't dwell on that. I've got to let it go, loose it out of my mind. I think, how could God save me? I was a wretch. I was pretending to be a holy pastor's wife, and I was living a, a life of hell at home and everywhere else. I was involved in all kinds of garbage. Now, I'm not saying we're not affected by our upbringing, especially when we have been the recipient of something tragic. I think our past does affect us sometimes, you know. But what I'm saying is we should not allow these things to keep us from being single-minded, from accomplishing the goal that God has for us for reaching the prize, and doesn't mean that we can't stop thinking about those things and loose it out of our mind and retrain our thought life. Every time I think about my past, I choose to stop and start thinking on what I need to be doing now. God has saved me. God has forgiven me. That's just a ploy of the enemy. People that dwell in their past and stay in the past, ladies, you've allowed Satan to get a foothold in your life. And he wants you right there so you can be defeated and you're of no use to the kingdom of God when you stay in the past like that. I know people who do not move forward and they're ineffective for the Lord's work. But this would also mean that we forget our past accomplishments everything great we've done because you know what if we start living in the past of all the great things we used to do we come puff, become puffed up and proud right well you know I used to do this or I you know my mom was this or my dad was this and by the way can I add that we should not be watching other Christians in the race too often women do that too Paul says those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise Ladies, what happens is we see other Christian women and we're going, yeah, I mean, how come I can't be like her? I want to be like her. I, I haven't caught up with her in the race. I want to be like her. Or we look at others behind us and we go, huh, you know, too bad for her. I'm so glad I'm more spiritual and, you know, I know more Bible than she does and I've witnessed to more people than she has. One is cause for despair. The other is cause for pride and both are sin, right? We're running our own race, Right? not my husband's. I'm not running my husband's race. I'm running mine. In fact, I've told you this probably before. One of the most freeing verses to me in my marriage is not a verse about marriage, but it's a verse at the end of John when Peter, James, and John were walking along, and Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, Peter, when you were young, someone dressed you and carried you where you wanted to go, but guess what? When you're old, someone's going to dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he signified what death he was going to die. Peter was going to be crucified, and Peter looks back, and he goes, looks at John, and he goes, hey, 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 what about him? <laughs> what about John? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, what is that to you? You better follow me. And you know, that's helped me so much in my marriage, so much in it. What is that to you, Susan? What is that to you, what he does? Or what is that to you, what she does? You better follow me. And you know what? I got enough to worry about my own life. <laughs> I got enough stuff to work on. So we can't look at others either. We're running our own race. Now notice the other way in which Paul pursues the one thing. Not only by forgetting what's behind, but he says, by reaching forward to those things which are ahead. This means to stretch oneself. And again, the readers there at Philippi would understand this because they knew much about the Olympic races. It was very common in those days. And this was describing the runner who would like, you know, how they do. We've seen them on TV. They reach forward for their, that last stretch <laughs> to get to the goal line. And their legs are stretching. And even, you know, sometimes they just even win it by just a little bit on their nose. I strain with all the determination I can so I can get that prize. Now, ladies, in order for an athlete to run, they've got to be in shape, right? Even though I don't, I'm not a runner. I do like to walk, but I don't like to run. But you've got to be in shape, right, to run. We, too, as believers, we must run the spiritual race, but we must be in shape. In fact, Paul tells us in another place how we can be in shape. He actually mentions three ways. Listen to this. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, 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 who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of God. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. I told you I only had two hours of sleep, so it's what you get. 
Ladies, if you want to be in shape for the race you're running, you must, according to that verse, those verses, number one, you must lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares you. What are the sins that ensnare you? Secondly, you must run with patience. Thirdly, you must look to Jesus. That must be the goal. Ladies, what sin or sin is weighing you down? You know you can't run the Christian race with those sins attached to your spiritual life or you will not run very far at all. Secondly, you must run with patience. Don't get in a hurry. Remember the tortoise and the hare? <laughs> it's a great example of that. The story you've read to your kids, you know? Remember they were on a race together and, and uh, the wise far... Uh, the, uh, I'll just read it to you. What a slow way you have. Well, remember the hare once made fun of a tortoise and said, what a slow way you have, he said. How you creep along. Do I, said the tortoise. Try a race with me and I'll beat you. What a boaster you are, said the hare. But come, I will race with you. Then they asked the wise and far fox to show them where to start and how to run. The tortoise lost no time and started at once and jogged straight on. The hare leaped ahead until he finally left the tortoise behind. He knew he could get to the end quickly, so he laid down and took a nap. And when he awoke, he ran as fast as he could to the mark, but alas, the tortoise was already there. Slow and steady wins the race, said the fox. Ladies, we must be patient. That what, that's what the writer of the Hebrews said. Run a steady pace. And lastly, most importantly, we must look to Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He and he alone endured the cross, despised the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of God. Ladies, when we look to him, then we can run with patience and we can throw off the sins, for he is our great helper. So you might be asking, well, what's in this for me? I mean, really? Why should I go on? Really? I mean, why don't I just give up? Well, there's a reward for going on. Paul tells us what it is in verse 14. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the word press here carries the idea of an intense endeavor. In fact, the Greeks used this word to describe a hunter who was eagerly endeavoring to pursue his prey while fixing his eye on the object at a distance. What is Paul pressing towards? Notice what he says, the goal, the object that's at a distance. In fact, when the runners in the Olympic races would run, they would see a mark uh, at the end or an aim and they would run and pursue for that goal. And Paul's saying, I want that prize that I'm going to get at the end of the race. I want that prize. And back then, the prize wasn't very exciting. It was a garland made out of olive. They say olive leaves and pines and apples. I mean, it doesn't sound very, I don't think I would be, I would run for that. I might run for some chocolate or Starbucks coffee, <laughs> but not that. But in biblical times, it was a great event. And people would get around and, you know, the winner would, I mean, he'd not only get that garland, but... There would be tears of joy and excitement. There would be flowers. They were even exempt from taxes. Now, that might be a good reason to run. I just paid some hefty taxes. Uh, in fact, they were even given a great sum of money from the treasury. In fact, they say that it's, at some of the games, the emperor of Rome himself would give out the awards. So it was a big thing to win the race in those days when Paul's writing. And Paul here has in mind when he says, I press for the prize, it's, it's not, you know, the big garland or being exempt from taxes or anything like that. But the prize is from God because he says, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul's thinking of? Glory, heaven. That's why I press on. I press on so that when I get there, I'll, waiting for me, is the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In fact, Paul mentions this in another place regarding his race. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you can obtain, for everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for imperishable crown. Ladies, Paul says, I go on because I'm pressing towards the mark for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You know, those that ran in the Olympic races, those wreaths, they're going to wear out pretty quick, especially if they're made of olive leaves and apples. They're going to start molding probably. And even all that other stuff, being exempt from taxes, you know, flowers, they're all going to perish away. 
but not those who press toward the mark or the prize of the high calling of Christ in Christ Jesus. That's incorruptible. That's unfading. That will never perish. That's forever and ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> So let's go over quickly what we learned. What's the reason that Paul goes on from verse 12? So that he can lay hold of the purpose for which Christ laid hold of him. What is the right means that Paul takes to go on from verse 13? He forgets the past and secondly, he reaches forward. Thirdly, what is the reward Paul receives for going on from verse 14? Heaven and all it offers, the best reward being Christ himself. That's the best thing. So in closing, what about you? Do you have the mindset of the Apostle Paul as you run the race? Are you holding on to your past, whether it's good or bad? Why? What are you doing right now to reach for the one thing, that prize that is eternal? Someone once said, my interest is in the future because I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. Is that where your interest is? Does your life show that by the fact that you are going on and on in spite of the past and going on and on reaching forth into the future? My dear sisters, go on, go on, go on, go on. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. It truly is the joy and delight of our heart. For we are called by your name, O Lord God Almighty. And I know that there are many weary sisters in this room. I know I've visited with many of them even this weekend that are burdened by many trials, by many troubles. And I pray, O Father, that you would use these very short words from the Apostle Paul through your Holy Spirit to encourage them to press on, forget the past, and move on. And Lord, may even now be the beginning of a new era for them, Lord, where they will press on for the reason that you have chosen them, that they would know what they are to be and to do in this life for the glory of God and for his kingdom, and that they would begin to weed out those issues and things in their life that are weighing them down and, and keeping them from pressing on and Lord some of those things that we might need to drop are going to be painful some of those things that we need to get out of our life so that we can run the race unhindered they might be painful but Lord help us to be obedient because Father we know everything in this world is going to burn up and Lord what's done for you is the only thing that's going to last so help us to have that mindset I pray for Christ's sake Amen